Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the webinar. Uh, my name is Ryan Murray. I've been working at Dremio for about a year. I'm uh, working there as a developer doing um, some open source projects and some research and that kind of stuff. So today I wanted to share with you one of the uh, cooler things that we've been doing lately, which is our work on the Apache Arrow flight, and in particular for this talk, some of the stuff with um, the Spark connector and how that can apply to uh, sort of building data, mi uh, data microservices. So for those of you who um, aren't aware, I just thought I'd level set on what Apache Arrow is. Get everyone on the same page before we go any further. So <clears throat> Arrow's really become sort of the, the inter industry standard uh, for in-memory data. I'm not sure how many people have heard about it, but as you can see, it's, it's in tons of different applications. So it's used in Spark and in Dremio. NVIDIA is doing some interesting stuff with it on GPUs. It's kind of spreading all over the place. And that's, uh, that's really by design. One of the goals that uh, we had when we first formed Spark as a, uh, sorry, Arrow as a community was to make it a lingua franca for data. The idea that if you store data in Arrow format, which we'll get to in a few minutes, you can, um, there's all kinds of tools which you can leverage to do calculations on that data. And there's understood and clear and standardized ways to move data between processes and between um, applications and machines and whatnot. So since the first release of Arrow back in uh, December or so of 2016, you can see the grow, it's been growing exponentially. Every, every month there's, there's even more downloads. Um, Part of that is the broad language support. So you can see there's over, well, coming close to half a dozen languages now that it's implemented in. Some of these are um, uh, sort of using the C libraries and others are uh, native implementations of these libraries. And that really helps out with the lingua franca part of it as every, every programming language is sort of speaking the same data, uh, language when it comes to data. And as I said, the, the community is very active. There's like over 300 developers, and we're doing a lot of interesting stuff, making Arrow work on CPUs, GPUs, and in more recently, even FPGAs. So uh, what is Arrow? Well, simply, it's a uh, in-memory specification for data. It tells you how to lay out memory, uh, lay out your data in memory in a binary format that makes it extremely efficient for um, analytical workloads, large analytical workloads. And that's uh, irrespective of if you're on CPUs or GPUs or, or more exotic things. Aside from that, it's a set of tools. So you have the standard, and then we've built a lot of tools in the community to help you manipulate that, the data in that standard. So you can think of that as, you know, sort of Lego bricks for building uh, novel data applications. Some examples of this are uh, I.O., getting data into and out of Arrow from various formats, whether it's Avro or Parquet or something like that. And uh, other things are compute kernels or engines, which um, help you do calculations on Arrow, even to things like Flight, which is an RPC mechanism or other, other ways of trading data with other applications or, or processes. It's important to say what, what Arrow isn't, and it isn't uh, an installable system as such. You can't go and download a copy of Arrow like you would Spark and run it. Whereas it's a, it's a library, Spark uses Arrow to, to be efficient with calling their data. Nor is it a memory grid or an in-memory database or something like that. While you can build these sorts of things with, uh, with Arrow, it's, it doesn't have any of these things in it on its own. It's more a set of primitives. And finally, it should, it's important to mention, it's not really designed for streaming records. So you're not sending single row arrow batches around. You tend to have dozens or hundreds or thousands or millions of rows in a record batch. And that's mostly to, uh, to be efficient. There's the columnar data structure, which we'll describe in a second, is designed for, for larger data sets. And the overhead for small single, operation, single record operations is too high to make it useful for, for streaming. So that's what it is. What does is, what is the format look like? And the, as I mentioned, the important thing here is it's a columnar data format. So compared to the traditional memory format uh, down in the bottom right there, 
you, in your traditional format, you're going to have um, every row in your table is going to be uh, a block of contiguous memory. So to say you wanted to take the average of session ID or the, the max of session ID or something like that. To do that, you're going to have to read um, row one, and then you're going to have to skip ahead to row two to read the next value of session ID. And because the interleave uh, fields, they might be um, by uh, uh, variable length, they could be strings or whatever, you can't really hop to the next row. You have to read all those bytes. So you end up reading the entire data set to pull out your, your half, your single column of that data set. And that's really expensive for the CPU. So you have to load a lot of stuff into your cache. You're constantly breaking your pipelines and lots of branches and all that kind of stuff. And it's really not overly efficient. Arrow does something that um, will look familiar to the people who are familiar with Pandas. It stores everything in a columnar data storage. So there you have all of your session IDs in one contiguous block of memory. So now when you want to do calculations on that, you simply load that block. You can load a good chunk of that block directly onto the CPU cache and do that calculation in one go, sometimes leveraging SIMD, single instruction, multiple data um, operations, where you're actually doing these calculations in, in single CPU cycles. So you get a huge efficiency by having this locality of data. And it allows you to do all kinds of interesting things. Like I said, you can leverage some of the interesting architectural aspects of GPUs. There's lots of these scatter gather IO type of operations that you can do to really perform these operations efficiently. So that's the format. What are some of the building blocks? Um, <clears throat> so these are the Lego blocks I mentioned before. We have uh, a quick survey of some of the four most interesting ones. Um, first off is our parquet readers and writers. So what these are designed to do is get data from parquet to arrow or from arrow to parquet very fast. So this is done natively at the C++ level. So this is, a, is an extremely fast operation. This is uh, particularly useful because your parquet file formats are so similar to your arrow formats. So that you can sort of think of them as cousins. So it becomes very efficient to stream parquet into arrow. And then when the rest of your data pipeline is arrow, you're really not having to constantly change data structures and data formats. And you're never going to be marshaling data once it's out of parquet and into arrow. Similarly, a more uh, fast implementation is the feather implementation. If you're uh, familiar with uh, one of the arrow founders, Wes McKinney's work, you might've seen feather. That's a good way to get data between R and Python very fast. It's meant to be ephemeral. It doesn't last very long and it's going, it's not, um, it's not a durable storage like you'd expect from Parquet, but it's extremely fast. And then on the uh, sort of the compute kernel side, you have something called uh, Gandiva. And in that case, if you have a, uh, say you have an R, some arbitrary expression, maybe some filters from a SQL statement or uh, you're multiplying some columns together and dividing by another column, something like that. You can take that expression, feed it into Gandiva, and Gandiva will spit out um, some LLVM bytecode of that expression. And then LLVM uh, will just in time compile that into the machine, machine code for your native operating system. So here you're able to uh, generate arbitrary expressions on your arrow data, and you really get the speed of machine, of machine code, regardless of your starting language. So it doesn't matter if you're in Java, JavaScript, or Ruby, or whatever else, you're going to get um, full machine level speed on these compute kernels. And finally, zero flight. And that's, that's really why we're here today. And that's our uh, newest uh, member to these building blocks. And it's uh, our, our RPC mechanism. So what is, uh, what is Aeroflight? Um, simply, it's a, again, it's a protocol. It's a high performance protocol that defines how to move data between two systems. And the key here is uh, it's a bulk transfer system. And the, one of the reasons that uh, it's so much faster than other um, implementations is you take an arrow buffer and write it directly into your network buffer. So you don't have to translate your data before writing it onto the network. Similarly, the client is going to receive the error, the arrow data from the network, and it's going to materialize directly into an arrow buffer. So you're not dealing with all the, the marshalling and the expensive CPU calculations of having to constantly change the format that your data is in. 
So that's where the, the speed comes from. This also is sort of the last piece in our interoperability promise. So as I said, one of the founding points of Arrow is to make um, a lingua franca for data. And what the Arrow flight does is it allows uh, any system, any operating system, most any programming language to talk to each other um, in an in a, in a understood known language. We never have to um, marshal data, change data, transform data. And it's built up from the ground up to support parallel streams, which I'll get to in a few minutes, and um, security. So out of the box, in only if maybe a dozen lines of Python, you can write a uh, flight server that will be SSL encrypted and have security attached to it. So some of the some of the features that you expect are built built in right out of the box. So how does this uh, protocol actually look like? Well, so it's built uh, primarily the underlying format is gRPC. So if you're not familiar with gRPC, it's a uh, Google's RPC mechanism. And the idea there is you define a uh, concrete set of operations that you know how to do, and then clients come in and request you to do those operations by supplying you with data or requesting data from you, something like that. One of the core concepts around uh, gRPC is the concept of streams. So rather than I give you some data, you give me back some data, I can open up a stream and continuously feed you data or receive data from you. So what a client-server client interaction looks like is going to be something like, I'm going to send you data. Here's a batch, here's a batch, here's a batch, here's a batch, I'm done. And that's uh, some of the efficiency and some of the, the um, ease of use around gRPC helps us uh, do that, and it's, it's going to be really fast. We also will interact with a relatively low layer of gRPC, which is uh, where we're able to get the zero copy between the uh, network buffer and the um, and the in-memory process buffers. Some of the kind of things that uh, Flight can support right now is you can do um, puts and gets. So you can give a server data, you can get server uh, data from a server. And a recent addition is something uh, a bi-directional streams. So that's a constant interchange of, of data. And everything is initiated by the client here. So the um, the client is in control of how these transactions happen. And you're never standing around waiting for a server to contact you. So this is what got us thinking originally about the concept of microservices. So you're gonna have, um, say you have a Spark uh, instance, Spark cluster and a Dremio cluster, and you want a very large data set from Dremio into Spark for some data science application where you can so you use the uh, flight connector and you can stream in parallel, bring back a very large data set very quickly. Then you train your model and you expose that model as a flight endpoint. So now a uh, further downstream consumer is able to send you a matrix and get back a prediction vector or something like that. So you're able to um, start getting the, the concept of around of um, <clears throat> a bunch of small servers doing really uh, concrete things. Something more esoteric might be you're, you're doing a machine learning mixing model. So you ask the, the system for a prediction and then it federates out to a bunch of different machine learning models. And since they all know how to talk flight and they're all using Arrow under the hood, they can be you know TensorFlow, Spark, Vanilla Python, it doesn't really matter. Ask all those to train the, the data on their individual models, bring all that back, mix it together in the upstream microservice before sending it back to the client. So you can start breaking down your data pipeline into a bunch of distinct components that can be reused, um, uh, deployed, and developed uh, individually. So you can start seeing this sort of microservices architecture come out of this, uh, out in this data world. And for me, at least, I think this makes uh, the concept of a data machine learning pipeline much more palatable to manage and control and, um, and build and maintain. So <clears throat> that's kind of the underlying. How does, how does the parallel streams work? Well, when you ask a server for a data set, you're going to ask for a uh, flight information and you're going to get back a set of flight endpoints and those flight endpoints represent your stream 
So if you collect data from all those flight endpoints, you'll have your entire data set. And the flight endpoint is simply a flight ticket, which is a, a token to say you're allowed to get that data set. And it identifies a very specific portion of a specific data set and an endpoint. So you know where to get the data from. So when you get back this set of flight endpoints, you're then able to, um, to break those up any way you want. If you get 10 back from your um, flight server, you can redeem uh, flight tickets one at a time in serial if you want. Or you can do them in a big bang, say you can spread them across a parallel system, either in memory for a single, single process, or you can send that across a bunch of Spark executors. And you're really just linearly multiplying your, um, your ability to move data at that point. And um, <clears throat> right now, the, the way you get data from Spark, or from Flight, excuse me, is either um, sort of a dotted namespace. So you can say uh, list flights, and that'll say all of the namespace separated data sets that that flight server knows about. Or you can even send it a, a SQL query. So you can send a, a full SQL query. The downstream server will execute that SQL query and send you the results back. So more concretely, that's sort of the parallel system will look more like this. If you have a, a Dremio cluster and you're, say, a Python client, the Python client will issue a get flight info to the, to the coordinator, to the Dremio coordinator, which will return back a set of endpoints. And then the client knows to go to each of those endpoints with their specific tickets to get the data. And in this case, it'll go to a bunch of Dremio executors to get the data. So if the client was a Spark client, then you can have um, your Spark executors facing off against your Dremio executors, and you're just getting individual pieces of your data, uh, data back into your Spark executors. So <clears throat> that's flight. Now let's talk about um, what the Spark source looks like. First, our Spark source is built off of the uh, relatively new data source version 2. Um, that came out, I guess, a couple of Spark versions ago. It was a complete rewrite on the data source API and um, has a lot of really interesting, really exciting features for people building data sources. And as big of a change as that was, there was even another very large change going into, um, going into Spark 3. So it's a lot of really cool stuff happening for these data sources. For us, some of the most important stuff is the columnar support, so you can um, do stuff with arrow batches, for example, uh, transactions, which isn't very important for this example, but is really powerful. So you can actually perform like acid transactions on your um, underlying data source. And if that's a flight data source talking to a uh, large scale, say, Dremio cluster or something like that, then you're able to do some pretty powerful transactions. there. It's also um, easier to control uh, partitions and how to map um, data source partitions into um, Spark partitions and better support for pushdowns, which is really important for, for SQL sources. So the, the Spark source for flight, what that looks like is, um, so it leverages the columnar batch, as I said before. So you're actually pulling arrow buffers directly from the flight source into, um, into Spark's in, internal arrow representation. So the columnar batch is actually using arrow under the hood. It's also fully supporting pushdowns. So if your flight server is, a, uh, is able to understand SQL, then you can generate generic um, SQL queries inside of your Panda, inside of your Spark data frame. And the source will translate that down into SQL before sending it off to the Spark source. Um, currently, the data source v2 is only capable of doing um, pushdowns for uh, filters and predicates, so it doesn't support things like joins or aggregates. So it does limit how much heavy computation you're able to push down to your downstream sources, but um, hopefully that'll be added in the near future, and then that can really you're really able to send arbitrary SQL down to your to your flight sources from um, from your Spark data frames. And then finally, for our use case, we're going to partition by um, arrow flight ticket. So the, um, 
the flight source, the flight server is going to generate a bunch of arrow tickets, and then those arrow tickets are going to be federated out as partitions in Spark so that the, the downstream uh, system is actually able to control how, how it's going to best partition the data given the queries that's being sent. So that's, that's it for the Spark source. It's relatively simple. There's a link to the GitHub repo at the end of the talk. Um, I encourage everyone who's interested to go and give it a try. Um, for now, let's talk about uh, benchmarks, the fun stuff. So for this benchmark, uh, we worked on uh, AWS. Um, we took the most recent version of EMR and faced that off against uh, Dremio AWS edition. So in both cases, we're going to have um, four nodes, four relatively large nodes. So relatively uh, equal comparison of, of compute power. And then for uh, we're going to run a bunch of different data sizes. For each data size, we're going to um, perform some non-trivial calculation on the Spark side. And that's to make sure that we uh, use every row and every column and uh, to make sure that Spark or Dremio aren't playing games on this. When I was first working on this, we were um, Spark and Dremio are both relatively smart, so they were dropping columns that weren't being calculated on. And what that gives us is uh, two times. The first time is the time for the entire calculation, the Spark, Dremio, and on the wire calculation. And then the time in brackets is the on the wire time. Uh, everything's measured in seconds. So just focusing on uh, JDBC versus serial flight, you can see uh, significant performance improvements between JDBC and flight immediately on the single, um, single serial use case of flight. So there's already a good argument for why um, flight could be a good uh, replacement for JDBC or EDBC in the future. And then when we start talking about the, the parallel stuff, we can really see uh, massive performance improvements. So we're seeing orders of magnitude improvements over JDBC, many, several multiple orders of magnitudes in some cases. Um, for, for a point of reference, the, uh, when we were using eight nodes of both EMR and Dremio and moving a billion records, that totaled something like 80 gigabytes of data. And that meant uh, that boiled down to something like four gigabits per second of bandwidth on each one of those nodes, um, which is actually a significant portion of the total EC2 bandwidth available. So at this point, we're actually moving data pretty much as fast as we can move it on, um, on these modern cloud networks, which is really exciting. And I think this is what really makes, for me, uh, the concept of a um, of these microservices, which are distinct, um, isolated components all talking to each other, uh, a real reality. So thanks everyone for watching and listening and uh, happy to take any questions and, uh, and here's some links to get you guys started with Flight and with Arrow.